Okay, wonderful. So hello, good morning, good evening, good afternoon to uh, everyone who's joined the call today. Uh, my name is Ravi Mystery. I work for the Information Lab as part of the customer success team. I'm joined today by my colleague, Chris Love. Chris, if you want to introduce yourself. Hi, folks. So, yeah, my name's Chris Love. Uh, I, I work as an account manager at the Information Lab. Uh, so this is, if we moved on to the next slide, this is a, a part of a series um, and actually, in, in fact, a lot of our other, other webinars and events that are going to be running from uh, online, given the current situation where everyone virtually is remote. Uh, so if you've been to any of our trainings um, and haven't been able to either come down to London, well, uh, now is a great time to um, hop onto our meetup group and sign up to any of the trainings that you uh, would like to join. And I'll, in fact, share that with others. We'll also be running similar events to this one, um, as well as, for example, a tip week. Uh, last week, we ran the first of this series. So myself and my colleague, Emma White, are running um, a series on customer success uh, around different elements of so high, high, high level thoughts more than anything. Um, so we, we ran one last Thursday, which you can find on YouTube um, on our channel, uh, which was about building a, a community of practice amidst remote circumstances where we talked a bit about how uh, we as the information lab have typically been a remote company and, and how we sort of deal with that. Um, you can see on the screen right now uh, a bunch of different events that are coming are coming soon uh, and we hope to see you at, um, at the next one which is on Thursday uh, but today we'll be focusing on data culture. So without further ado I'll, I'll allow Chris to sort of go through and introduce the topic. Hey folks. Um, so yeah, we're, we're going to be talking about um, data culture um, and the urgency of really becoming a, a data driven organ, organization is really real. And I think most people, in fact, almost everyone I speak to is struggling to get there. And those who think they're already there are probably mistaken. So we're going to dive a lot deeper into the culture and how critical it is to become data driven and how hard it is to change and then give you some tips around building that data culture that you need. But first of all, I wanted to kind of share my story about being part of a culture um, and growing into that as uh, the information lab. So uh, I work remotely, I work out of our Nottingham office and over the last few years, I've seen a huge cultural shift in the way the, the information lab works. We, we run, uh, hit training on a Tuesday in the office, boxing in the office on a Wednesday morning, yoga in the office on a Thursday morning. And these all happen down in London. We've got our Tough Mudder team you can see there. And there's this huge push for exercise and, and motivating. And this culture is built up around the team for everybody to get involved in that. There's runs, there's a St Strava group, and everyone's in encouraged to take part. But it's not really been until recently that I've been able to take part because a lot of those sessions have moved remotely. So I've finally been able to feel part of this culture that I've seen from afar and it's really transformational. I'm over on the on the right there, you can see my son in the middle, I'm just off screen in the orange t-shirt feeling a little bit embarrassed um, at doing boxing with, with a load of colleagues but it's been absolutely fantastic to be part of that, that culture at the Information Lab and it's it's driving some real changes in my life and in my kids' life. Uh, this is the family doing, um, doing PE of the morning um, as they're kind of learning and, and growing. Uh, now they're at home and, and I'm homeschooling. So what does that have to do with uh, what we're talking about today? Well, it's because every company is, is a data company. Every organization needs to be data driven. And when I talk about being data driven, I probably mean kind of human driven, but data educated. I think we, we can't remove the human decisions, especially as we've seen over the last few weeks. Um, but in this data era, organizations need to be data driven. Um, and that they will be the ones that thrive. Um, it's not just me saying this. So um, you can see research from Forrester's group that say that companies who are more insight driven and more capable see better business outcomes. They say that public companies will grow at least seven times faster than global GDP if they're using, in, if they're insight driven. McKinsey have done research that says there's much better performance in new acquisition, so 23 times better more 
um, customer acquisition and nine times more customer loyalty in companies that do better with their data. And, and you can see this quoted on um, Tableau's uh, data culture slide and uh, Mark Jewett's talk before about this at the, the Tableau conference as well. But how do you get there? How, how do you get to be this amazing data-driven company? Well, the answer is in your data culture. And it's really hard to do that. As I say, everyone is striving to be this, this amazing data-driven company, but no one's getting there. You're perhaps sat there frustrated, but your culture, your internal data culture, isn't one that you think that your organization should have. You've perhaps tried rolling out programs. You're perhaps um, not getting the support from senior leaders, or you're a senior leader trying to drive this out to your organization and hitting stumbling blocks. Um, and so what me and Ravi are going to do is talk about some of the funda fundamental aspects of a data culture as, as we work through this. But before we do, I'd really like to talk about the, what we mean by a data culture and, and how we define it. So I think people are really the heart of that data culture. Um, and really what we're talking about is the, the behaviors and the beliefs of those, those people. Um, the people who, who kind of practice and encourage the use of data within our organizations. And so that's kind of what we mean. And when we talk about behaviors and um, the beliefs, then I think really what we're seeing is two sets of things. We're seeing the implicit things that, that we see. So, um, sorry, the, the explicit things that we see uh, as, we, as we kind of work within, within our organizations. So things like budgets, things like policies, internal policies, um, perhaps from IT, etc. Those are the really explicit things we can see that really change our culture. But I'd say probably what's more important it, and the things that can start to shape those explicit things are the implicit underlying um, behaviors that we see within our organization, the things that we can have more influence on. And they're often very, very much underneath the surface. I've, I've heard this talked about kind of the iceberg anal analogy before. A lot of the, that data culture implicit behaviors are beneath the surface. And those, those are things like values, beliefs that we, that we work with. Now, Tableau have um, run a survey. They, they run a survey across a, thousands of senior executives um, across companies they work with. And they identify five different areas that can influence the, um, the culture within an organization. And what makes these, these very successful organizations tick. And they say that a, a successful organization fosters trust. They develop talent, they seek commitment, they support sharing and they change mindsets. And so, what I'd like to invite myself and Ravi to do is work through each of these and discuss what each of these means to us and how you can implement those. So let's start with trust. So Tableau say that successful data cultures create high trust environments where organizations place their trust in people and people can trust their data. Now Tableau have got kind of four bullet points that we'll come to, but Ravi, do you want to spend five minutes kind of discussing between ourselves what this mm -hmm. means to, to us and how, how we work with organizations to, to help them develop trust. What are your yeah, thoughts? For, yeah, for sure. So I, I feel like the, the trust element is really important because the second that people often, the, the first things people will do when they see a new report versus the, the thing they're used to, you know, that thing that have habitually got stuck to is they start comparing numbers. So the moment you have to understand is you have to be able to almost defend and be ready to, to build that trust in this new new way of doing things. So say, for example, uh, an organization has focused on having reports in Excel. And in that Excel report, a number for this month is different from the number that they're showing on a dashboard that you've created. Perhaps that, 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 that element of trust has to be built in sort of, you almost have to start unpicking and helping them understand that, hey, this is, that there is trust in this data and this is where it's coming from and this is how it's been calculated. And, and sort of almost work cohesively. I think inviting that person onto the journey and, and those people onto the journey with you uh, is really important when you're trying to build that trust between, between people. 
Yeah, I, I agree. I think, you know, you've, you've hit on something really important there, and that's the, the relationship side of things. You know, it's, it isn't just something that you can um, push, push on and um, get trust from people. You need to work with people to do that. You need to build up those relationships, and that often means sitting with them and working through the, the data sources that you've built. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking data sources, because that's often the, the place where the most people can immediately lose trust. So building out a single um, repository of data. So we want to try and talk agnostically here, so rather than focus on, a, on a, any given platform, obviously these, um, these behaviours are, are ones we're taking from Tableau themselves. But I think, you know, if, if, you, if you get the data sources right, and really build those out and develop a high level of trust in those, Mm -hmm. then everything else can flow from there and it's often in those relationships that you build on that trust. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and I think also alongside that, the, there's an element of um, you, the, the, there's opportunity here as well. So for example, on moving forward and fostering that change and, and having that change management side of it, because trying to find out where people are, the struggles they're having and how this can help solve the problems they're having, I think that's quite an important step that can be taken uh, around trust for sure. I've heard um, Robert Radburn talk about this. Um, he's he's a, kind of someone we work with over at Leicester County Council, um, and, and he's talked a lot at the Tableau conference before about data chauffeuring. And you, you're you're really there to chauffeur someone through their data, and as you build those relationships, you're really there just to, to guide them to be a concierge and be the chauffeur to show them their own data and give them trust in that. And I, I, that's a great concept for me. Uh, yeah, I love, I love that concept. I think um, the data show fair is a great, because you are really taking someone on a journey, um, especially around, like I said, fostering a data culture is very much about change management. Um, so, so moving forward from there, that, that's, that's very important for sure. Shall we move on to the, the, the second sort of pillar? Yeah, so um, I guess before we do, just picking up on some of those things that Tableau mm -hmm. say. So high trust relationships with data, teams encourage data access and transparency. Data governance is a really important thing to mm -hmm. get right here. And I think that's, that's, very, um, that's very different for different organisations. And you need to find the right level of data governance to instill confidence in, in, in your organisation. Um, and, and that might be very open access if that's the um, how your organization goes or it might be very tight data governance so that people have got the right confidence mm -hmm. and then the expectations for res responsible data use as well the next one is talent yeah um i think you know all, all great data cultures have a very pronounced focus on people and talent so um thinking about things like data literacy, critical thinking and thing, cr critical thinking. Um, what are your thoughts on talent? I, th I think this is, this is the sort of holy grail, right? I think that the reason the information I've started data school was to address the, the, the sort of uh, the, the lack of talent within the data industry and sort of try and ha um, tackle that head on, right? Uh, and having gone through that myself, I feel like that's, it's such a unique process. Um, and I think on an organizational level, the trick, the, the trick is finding, firstly, finding those people and training them up, but also the retention. The retention is so important. Like um, a, a lot of conversations I've had where, uh, is where people are almost worried to help people get to a level of certification and proficiency because they're worried that they, they're, they're on this conveyor belt of training someone else to get really good and then they move on to, to pastures anew. Um, but I think that, that that element of talent um, sort of development and retention comes back to giving people that purpose and fulfillment and giving them something that they can own and hold and that almost links back to trust right like all of these things are interconnected i think having trusting someone to own something and build something means that they they they, they grow, their, their their attachment grows to that thing um so then they're able to to sort of push forward and also give give back and train other people right that that's that's the key here you really want that not to be a one and done process, but it to be a, um, or a, you're fostering generations of talent within your organization. Absolutely. How, how do you think the recruitment fits into that? Get, getting the, 
the right individuals? Is that something that um, I often get asked, should people recruit the right talent in or should they look to train it up? And what are your thoughts there? I think that there's value on both, right? So I think, you know, there's, there's an age old adage of, do you get the um, uncut gem and, and sort of tweak and work on making that in, in your own sort of image? Or do you find someone with new ideas and adapt yourself? And I think there's, there's value in both. I think the, the, the most important thing for an organization is to understand what do they need right now versus what will they need? And sort of trying to surface that long-term, short-term and medium-term vision in order to, to in, in, into how they're recruiting. Um, I think the tricky part there is we, we, you never have the ideal plan, right? So like, like that John Lennon phrase, life happens when you're busy planning other things. Like you don't get to stop, look around and figure stuff out. It's an iterative process. And um, you almost have to fly by the skin of your pants at some points to, to sort of trust that things will, work, will shake themselves out. But I think, you know, with, with, this, with the way that the world is going, it's going to be like upskilling and training is, is becoming such a big thing. But again, given the circumstances, uh, think of how many uh, courses are becoming now online and, and often some of them are now free for people to, who are either between jobs uh, or looking to upskill in their spare time. Yeah, that kind of, uh, that, that enablement program, mm -hmm. building things around things that you can, you can get for free building levels and, and letting everyone know what that enablement program looks like is a real key part of developing that, that talent. Um, and also I think that should be led from the top down. So senior staff should do analytics training as well as um, um, For sure. the, the, the more junior, more technical analysts. Um, it's kind of really important um, that, that both leaders do that. And then the, the, they encourage and reward that use of data as well. So lead, lead, lead by example. That, I mean, that transparency is going to pay back in kind over, or over a period of time for sure. Absolutely. Um, the next one to talk about is commitment. So um, great organizations seek commitment. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not just, not just paying lip service to the importance of data and an analytics. And this is something that, um, we, we've seen at Jaguar Land Rover, you know, they, they have heavily invested in that commitment from, um, from individuals and, um, and really pushed that as a strategic asset that they, they needed to, to yeah. develop. And then they talked widely about that at conference. So um, again, you know, it overlaps with the last one, um, sponsoring um, data-driven behavior and, 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 and also modeling it. What exactly. are your thoughts on commitment? Yeah, you're right. I mean, leading by example is so important here. And I think that, that that directive almost helps encourage things. So say, for example, if a middle manager tells you, hey, we're going to go big on this data thing and see if anyone likes it, that's less valuable than a CEO doing a big speech and going around to each team being like, this is where we're going. We have to make it work. And I'm relying on you to do it. Like, that senior buy-in is, so, is, is such a motivation for people, especially you know, given that we, we always like to impress and do, do well at, at the highest level possible, right? Um, th that's where ambition plays into these things. That's where some level of competitiveness plays into things. But I think there's also a commitment to the people. I think there's also putting them, um, or almost the money where your mouth is situation where, hey, we're not just gonna go in on this and expect you to pick this up and be the best. We also want you to do formal training. We also want you to become certified. We want you to be embedded in this. We're gonna give you time as part of your day of, over the next six months you know, during your weeks to really upskill and focus on this data thing that we're going in on. I think that's something that with that example you gave, Jaguar Land Rover did quite well. But I think I've seen many other companies do this as well, regardless of size. Like, mm. I think it might be perhaps more difficult in a bigger organization, but a smaller team and a more agile team is able to be quite nimble on their feet, especially around directives and saying like, right, let's go. Like, this is how we're going to make things work. One of the most practical ways I've seen of people displaying commitment is simply bringing data to meetings on laptops and using that as the the center point of the meeting. So yeah, for sure. we're committed to using data across this organization. And here we are, we're going to start every meeting with the, with a look at the data and everyone's kind of empowered to then contribute those, the uh, insights around that, that data rather than just being, opinion led which often is is just something that comes from 
the people um, that don't we're designing, right? <laughs> the people highest up in the meeting. Exactly. Um, support sharing. Um, so most big organisation challenges uh, aren't really limited to a single team. We we don't see kind of the same report factories with uh, with self service tools now that we perhaps used to. Um, we don't see single teams building this out. So it, it needs kind of cross team collaboration and access to data from multiple systems to really um, bring different perspectives and bring bring everyone in an organization along, but also to share that that talent. It's no longer kind of the um, the owner shouldn't be on a single team to kind of grab grab all the glory almost yeah. and, um, and push that out. Yeah, that, that, I love that. So that, that's I think this getting the sharing part right, and the, I've seen so many more companies um, try cross business you, you, business unit sharing, and the element of hey, let's we're all working for the same company, so why should we be competing to get the limelight right? And I think that cross functional support is growing so much. And I think that's also a really good way of retaining good talent, because if if someone's committed to a company and they they understand the sort of values and ethos and the direction. And they're then enabled to go out and work with the wider business and sort of dig into areas they perhaps might not have been able to before. Um, that really helps to not just spark ideas, but also try and understand the different ways other people work and bring that, bring that home. And I think that natural sh- um, um, desire for excellence is something that certainly companies uh, are trying to do. But I think it's encouraged when you, when you have this bed of, and this culture of sharing and this culture where, you know, there's, everyone's on the, uh, an even keel and there's no right or wrong answers. We're all trying to figure this out together. Um, alongside that, I think I- events and going away and doing uh, company-wide hackathons, again, with senior stakeholder buy-in, so important because the ability to work across, on a data set that, or a, a, a set of challenges that work across a business and then the ability to then present that back to senior stakeholders, that's what gets people buy-in. That's what gets people up in the morning, as it were. That's what gets people really engaged with how things are working, right? And, and, and understanding what they can do as part of that organization. They're not just a cog. Yeah, uh, you, you mentioned excellence there um, as, as you were talking. And I think, you know, one thing to, to pick up on there is that a lot of organizations, excellence isn't necessarily the ball or certain teams. No. So, you know, when we talk about centers of excellence, COEs, often I, I like to refer to them as centers of enablement. Um, I think Simon Bowman at JLL um, shared that in a recent blog post as well. But just thinking about how do you enable people and and grow that out? And that's a really, I think that's a great way of of looking at it. It's not just who's the best at doing this. Correct. Um, So finally, changes mindset. Great companies change mindset. So um, it's fine kind of having that, um, that, that growth in culture but you are going to have to change mindsets along the way and you this is going to be a difficult transition for organizations to uh, to make um what do you think about changing mindset i, th- I think mindset's really uh, uh this is this is at the bottom of everything we're doing because i think that the honest way to describe a data culture and or in fostering one is is change management because the big thing you're trying to do here is try and change the way people approach their world and change the way that they're working day to day. And I don't see it as changing a mindset as much as augmenting, you're most enhancing and enabling people, as, we, as we've mentioned through this, uh, to do more. Um, and I think that the, the easiest way to get people on side with resistance is not think about data and not talk about data to begin with, but focus on the problems they're having day to day. So how do you take what I do as some, a data person and my tools in my toolbox to help what you're doing and, and frame it and reform it in their world. That's really important. And that's where you get someone's buy-in because they, they then stop thinking about the products and the concepts. They start thinking about their problems and how they can help and how their lives can be made easier. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think you know doing doing that is is then what leads to to exploration and innovation across the organization um, so how do you um, kind of go about doing that then you know we've we've talked about these different 
areas. I think mm-hmm. this this takes some some assessment of working out where you are on this on this path. Which which areas do you need to to focus on and work yeah. with? And Ravi, do you want to talk a little bit about Blueprint and the work we've been doing with that? Yeah, for sure. So the Tableau Blueprint, for those of you that don't know, is uh, Tableau's framework. I guess is the best way to put it um, for for almost creating data driven culture, but is spoke to you because every company is along their journey and, and along that journey, they're going to have different issues in their own different uh, challenges that they're facing. That's what we're trying to do to help. So myself and Emma, we work closely alongside to the Tableau team um, to work with Blueprint, not just for Tableau, but for Altrix as well, uh, because the concepts are very much agnostic at all. But with Blueprint, what you're able to do is do a survey, then get some recommendations. And what we try and do from there is, and give ideas and action plans from, from on, on that basis. I think something like Blueprint, if you read it cover to cover, it's kind of like either long or obvious. Uh, but what it reminds you to do is it's almost like a checklist of, hey, have we considered thinking about a governance plan? Have we considered thinking about how we're going to grow a community? Uh, and that's what I quite like about it. It's, it's a really good conversation starter and it has its own voice as well, uh, which can be challenged. And we, we always, we're always going back and forth on with customers on what, what works best for them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we actually have a, a question um, coming from um, Chris, one of our listeners. Uh, so Chris's uh, question is, how do you deal with resistant and obstructive stakeholders? Uh, Chris, do you want to start off with that one? Chris on the call. Resistant and obstructive stakeholders. Um, I think they're, they're some of the best people to, um, to try and get on board, to be honest. You know, that once, you, once you start cracking those people, then it can be... Um, that, that those can be your your biggest wins um it, it, i guess it, the, the the true answer is it depends on how they're being resistant and obstructive is it something that they're um they're not bought into the the tool the the tools you're using or the the reports that you're giving it or is it more that they, they they're not working in in the ways perhaps with uh, wanting more tables rather than visual analytics and things um, I think the, the way you pr- perhaps tackle those are, are slightly different. If, if there's someone who's really resistant to, to what you're building, then sometimes bending and, and giving them what they want to start with and then um, incorporating small changes in there. So if they want tables, they're really resistant, resistant to getting anything else and introducing small elements like colour heat maps in there before then building out to, to bigger elements. Um, but but also working around them as well so um you can you can build good content with their colleagues and these people will have to get on board eventually if you've got you know three or four stakeholders and one of them is really being obstructive as soon as they're seeing that they've not got the great content that everyone else has got that they're building out and they've not got the answers then they'll get left behind and they'll have to catch up yeah for sure um richard on the call he's raised his hand uh if you want to type your question or 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 let us know whether you want to want to raise us to speak um chris if you can hop to the next slide i appreciate we're we're almost uh, up to the hour so if we um as chris has shown on there uh you can look go on to tableau.com for such data culture to find out more about sort of tableau's take on this um as well as alongside uh, the blueprint um as i mentioned at the start of this call thank you all for joining and um we do have many other sessions coming up along the same vein. Uh, so if you hop back to the uh, meetup slides, Chris. Yeah, I'm trying to, I didn't put one at the end. That's fine. You asked um, me to. Yeah. Perfect. So um, as, as we said, we're, we're going to be running uh, a couple of in tandem Tuesdays about understanding um, sort of trends in 2020. And then Thursdays, myself and Emma will be talking about sort of some of the pillars of the blueprint and, and digging into them a bit deeper. Um, so yeah, thank you all for joining. We're going to carry on for a bit longer if anyone has any further questions, um, but I appreciate if you have um, other meetings to join. So thanks everyone for joining and do, do join our meetup group to, to find out more. Thanks everyone. Cool, so I think Richard has hopped off. I can't spot him here. Yeah, no, he's still here. Um, But Elena um, has a question. Hi, Elena. So do you have any advice when you don't have committed sponsorship by an executive team to inspire this change in the way that data analytics should be seen by the rest of employees? Yeah, this this is a good question. So I think that there's a couple of ways to start nudging this. I think in in the Tableau world, 
uh, you can use subscriptions and custom views to, to build out um, the, the way that they're sort of digging into um, and interacting with that data so that you're almost putting it in front of them. Um, but also it's, um, finding the sort of inflection points, like what, what if, they, if they do want some sort of answer from the work they're doing, how can you, how can you um, change something that it's in the, so it's in their world, right? Um, in, in I mean, I guess, I guess the other, the other sort of follow up there is um, trying to make it not as much as a siloed thing, as in not not really focusing on Tableau or you know your data, your data uh, analytics um, arm of the company being its own thing, but focusing on it being well part of every day, right? Almost weaving it in so it's just normal to consider and talk about data. Uh, Chris, do you have any thoughts on that? Any any when 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 you don't have committed sponsorship, mm. you um, inspire the rest of the company, uh, and and the sort of vision and, and the perception of data analytics. I I think it's really really hard without exec team sponsorship, without someone pushing this down. So I focus on getting one of the exec team bought into your message or or how you're doing it, and that can it can be difficult, but find something that really find something that's a problem for them. Um, find something that really is is the the thing that they're constantly go talking about, or is a is a kind of a, a thorn in their side, and use data to solve that and give them a, a solution to that particular problem. And they people execs have got a lot on their plate. They're um, they're buzzing around all over the place, and they don't necessarily have time to sponsor these kind of initiatives. They perhaps think they're doing it already. Or, or don't really have time to look into the detail of how to do that. But if you find a problem that they can solve that is their pet problem, then they can suddenly see the value and, and start kind of listening a lot more. I think, I think it just takes that, both for, for the wider, wider group as well as exec level, right? Um, and the second, that's people are able to um, identify with the work you're doing and the, the sort of problems you're solving. That's when yeah. you really get, get, that, get that going forward. Uh, but really good question, Elena. Thank you. It's it's not easy, is the honest answer, and no one's cracked it. I think if if that was an easy answer, <laughs> then you know, Ravi would be out of the job. I would be out of the job for sure. Um, are there any other questions or comments um, before we wrap up for the for the afternoon? As I mentioned, for the 22 of you left on this call, um, we are going to be running these and you can find all of the sessions on YouTube afterwards. Um, but once again, thank you all for joining uh, today's session. Um, look forward to seeing you at the next one and everyone take care. Thanks all. Bye-bye.